am going to introduce the first speaker and turn it over to him. Our first speaker is uh, Jeremy Kepner of MIT, who will talk about the mathematical foundations of the graph laws and big data. Jeremy. Thank you very much, John. It is a real pleasure. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. If they can't, please you know, put something in the chat or whatever. Um, but uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the foundations of the graph laws and their relations to big data. And without further ado, let me go to the next slide. And I hopefully this actually will, I will uh, be able to get us, give my, the three minutes that John took back to the community uh, here. So let me see here, I'm trying to figure out how to. All right, there we go. So first I wanna just thank the team here at uh, MIT, um, a lot of great people and ultimately the Graph Laws community, many of whom are on this call. And um, let me just see here, I'm trying to get, oh, there we go. Uh, and so many of whom are on this call here. And so I very much appreciate um, the tremendous support this community has put into this effort. And I should actually spell out that graph law stands for graph basic linear algebra subroutines or subprograms, I should say. It is a, uh, an homage to the BLAS, the basic linear algebra subprograms that were developed so many years ago by Jack Dungara and others. And this is essentially a sparse or graph version of that. I realized that we did not spell that out in any of our slides. So I, I, I thought I might at least take that opportunity. So just some, I, most of this material is drawn from uh, a variety of texts, two of which I'll point out here. One is a paper called Mathematical Foundations of the Graph Laws. Uh, many of the authors of this paper are on the call uh, here today. And that's of course available in archive and, and, and the IEEE proceedings. <coughs> And so a lot of that, uh, a lot of what we're talking about is described in more detail here. And for those folks who really want to get into more detail, of course, I, I have to plug my book uh, from MIT Press. It's the number one selling math book from MIT Press, The Mathematics of Big Data. And uh, I would encourage people to take a look at that. And there, I believe, there is electronic or electronic versions of that as well that people can get. So that's where a lot of this material come from as well as other materials. So uh, I am not going to spend too much time on motivating why uh, the graph laws are a good idea. I think there are lots of uh, other talks that we'll call subsequently that, that, we'll, that we'll get into that. This is a SIAM meeting, so I'm really going to focus on the mathematical foundations, uh, and hopefully people will, find, will appreciate that. So this is sort of the obligatory um, kind of foundational uh, figure that we've been using for, you know, John first developed this figure in the 1990s and it has come essentially the, the logo of our community over the last uh, 20 years, which just is basically talking about the foundational graph adjacency duality. So on the left, you have a directed graph, you know, with vertices and directed edges. They're directed because they have arrows on them. And then we have an adjacency matrix which we show on the right. And if there's a connection, you know, every, each of the rows uh, are, uh, are, an, are a vertex and each of the columns are a vertex. And if there is an edge connecting any two vertices, we mark it with a dot. And the, the big idea here is that the fundamental operation of graph applications, which is breadth for search, i.e. starting at the vertex Alice and finding uh, Alice's neighbors, Bob and Carl, that that is sort of dual with the fundamental operation of linear algebra or matrix mathematics, which is vector matrix multiply. So if I take a vector uh, V and I have essentially one, uh, one non-empty entry or non-zero entry corresponding to the uh, row that corresponds to Alice, and I do vector uh, matrix multiply with respect to the adjacency matrix, in this case, the transpose, I should say, you know, normally we actually prefer not to work with the transpose and we do essentially row 
bro uh, uh, matrix multiply, you know, going from the left to the right, it's more natural. It's just that it's always easier been on to draw uh, uh, columns on the chalkboard. So that's why we always sort of uh, use this sort of co columnar view. But as you see, when you do vector times a transpose, we get the nearest neighbors, Bob and Carl. So this fundamental observation that the, the key operation of graphs and the key operation of matrices are the same is really kind of the foundational basis for all, all the work. And we've made great, uh, great use of this particular duality. And in fact, the rest of my talk is really going to sort of point out and observe a bunch of un other really useful dualities, this being the very first one. So another one is we talked about the adjacency perspective, which is where essentially every row and every column are a vertex. There's also what we call the edge perspective. So as, as I also said, there's, there is the edge perspective here. If, if other people could mute or I don't know if they're trying to reach me, but um, we have some background noise there. So in any case, um, there's also the edge perspective. And the edge perspective, in this case, I've made it simple and I have two uh, very large sparse matrices where the uh, rows are an edge number, right? If we imagine numbering each of the edges and we have a set of columns that are essentially the out vertex, i.e. the destination vertex, I mean the vertex that is coming, that the edge is coming out of, and then we have a set of columns called for E in, which is the vertices that, that the edge is going into. And you might ask why this is a very sparse and much bigger representation, why would we do this? Well, the edge perspective actually allows us to capture a few cases of graphs that are really extremely common. So on the left in particular, which you'll see, I have added to our canonical graph an edge labeled 12, which is a hyper edge. So hyper edge are drawn with these sort of amoeba shaped things. They're very difficult to draw, you know, have too many hyper edges on a drawing, but it basically says that, um, you know, uh, vertex uh, uh, seven has edges with, has, has an edge that simultaneously goes to, um, you know, vertex uh, 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 five and six. And this really captures a really common phenomenon, phenomenon like the phenomenon that's happening right now. I am talking simultaneously to 78 of you. That is very different than if I was, you know, uh, communicating with each of you uh, individually. And the adjacency matrix representation has no way of distinguishing those two uh, different things. It can just say that, you know, I was communicating, you know, with, you know, there's no difference between a simultaneous communication and separate communications. Uh, so, the, uh, so this is called a hyper edge and this edge perspective does a very nice job of representing hyper edges. It also uh, multiple edges. So we've now added an edge 13, which is identical to edge eight. And again, they're distinct. And again, the edge perspective allows to capture that. And I would say that um, this view, the edge perspective is often a more natural view closer to the data. So it, this often very, cons, co, this very nicely corresponds. You imagine each row is some kind of record that you're getting and the, you know, the columns represent, you know, different uh, vertex relationships in those records. And it's just very natural to build this. So when we work with people in the database community, this is for other communities that are very close to the data, this edge of perspective is very natural uh, way to, to do it. Now, fortunately, the two, these two perspectives, this adjacency and edge perspective are very closely linked. So essentially, if you multiply the transpose of the out edge times the uh, in edge matrix, you will get the adjacency matrix. And so this is sort of kind of like this fundamental duality between the edge and the adjacency uh, representations of this data. And um, again, very powerful. And I would say this often represents a very common step in processing of data. You'll start with data, it's, very, it's raw, a series of records, it will be coming in in an edge representation. And then as you do analysis, you'll create various projections of various adjacency matrices usually by selecting subsets of edges 
to create this adjacency matrix on the right. And so these two representations, both are very powerful, very useful, and there isn't really a, you know, a one or the other is always the best thing to, do, to use. That's simply not true. It depends on what your purpose is, but both are very powerful and very useful. And I would say in my own applications, we almost always start out with the edge representation. And then as we do analysis, we are switching into the adjacency representation. So mo moving on, uh, I, another representation, uh, you know, we often talk about the adjacency representation, which is, which is fairly uh, simple to uh, represent. And, um, but uh, another very common representation, which is called the Laplacian. Laplacian is very close to the adjacency, except that you essentially imagine if every vertex has a number of edges that's connected to it, that's essentially called the degree which is often re re represented by a vector D, okay? And uh, we can create the Laplacian by essentially taking the degree, putting it along the diagonal of a matrix, and then subtracting the adjacency matrix from it. And this is called the Laplacian. And both, again, are very useful. And I think a really fantastic paper that I recommend uh, everyone read, because there's no way I can true, do true justice to it, is the is a paper by Kerry Preeb and others. Uh, it's cited down there on uh, on a two truths phenomenon in spectral graph clustering. And you know this whole should you use the adjacency? Should you use the Laplacian? This has sort of been a a discussion topic within our community. And he does a great uh, example of essentially providing a a real specific case in terms of how they are capturing different phenomena. So if he does clustering based on the eigenvalues of the adjacency versus eigenvalues of the Laplacian, in this case on connectome data of, you know, taken from MRI scans of human brains, that he sees that there's a fundamentally different phenomenon. So the, if you take the, uh, the spectrum, the, uh, the spectrum of the Laplacian, you, you nicely separate the two lobes of the brain. And that's a clearly a very valid construct, something that you would want to uh, to, maybe, to maybe know. And likewise, though, uh, if you take the uh, spectra, the eigenspectra of the adjacency matrix, you essentially separate essentially a core periphery separation. You essentially are looking at uh, white matter versus gray matter in the human brain. And I'm not going to explore this further than that because I encourage you to read the paper. But again, this is one of those things people often debate. Is the adjacency better? Is the Laplacian better? Well, this is a great example. It really depends on kind of what kind of phenomena in your graph you're trying to highlight. So I think this is a really wonderful paper. I was first made aware of it last summer, and um, I do try and point it out to anyone that it's, again, a very uh, very again, it's just another uh, aspect. The Laplacian is another piece of our toolbox in in sort of matrix-based graph analysis. So moving on, uh, another very uh, useful thing and uh, is what we is uh, is is sparsity. So uh, and again, I would encourage people to mute their microphones because we're getting a lot of back uh, chatter here. So. Um, Very good. So uh, I would say that uh, a very important topic here is sparsity in matrices. And I'm just going to roughly define sort of heuristically what we, what we mean by sparsity. So on the left here, we have what we call a traditional dense matrix. And in that, I would say that the number of non-zeros, N and Z, of the dense matrix is going to be order if this is an n by n matrix, order n squared. That is essentially what you're saying is that most of the uh, of the entries in this matrix are uh, uh, non-zero, right? Uh, in graphs, since we're often dealing with uh, 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 loosely connected graphs, graphs where you know each vertex might only be connected to a handful of vertices. A uh, sparsity is extremely important. And so what we have here in the middle is a typical sparse graph. 
And I would say one way to think about that is the number of non-zeros is on order of the number of vertices, or in this case, the number of rows or the number of columns. So there's a one way to think about it. These are not hard and fast rules, but these are just ways to think about it. And I'd say another, uh, and, and this is very important, and this is why sparse matrices are so important in matrix-based graph theory, because we do need the, the storage efficiency and computational efficiency of representing the data in a sparse way. If we were trying to do all our computations using dense matrix math, well, we wouldn't be able to hold the matrices in memory and the computations would be prohibitive. So sparsity and, and, and uh, matrix graph analysis are two things that couple very naturally. And then another topic that I think is important that has sort of emerged more recently, and it's uh, basically been significantly enabled by uh, Tim Davis's recent work uh, with the graph laws, uh, but it building on, on others who've been developing this for a very long time. I know Aiden has been doing a lot with hypersparse uh, uh, ideas for a long time, um, is this concept of hypersparse. And this is where the number of non-zeros in the, 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 the matrix is much, much less than the total number of rows or columns in the matrix. So these are essentially imagine that the, 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 there's a gigantic sea of possible vertices and edges, but only a handful are um, explored at any given time. And I would say this is becoming a more and more important topic and we now have technologies that can do this. And I'd also make an observation that, um, and it's just, again, it's sort of my personal observation that Traditionally, when we're doing, you know, uh, matrix mathematics or linear algebra on dense, uh, on dense matrices, we're often very concerned about the accumulation of error, right? And we sort of measure and control the accumulation of error in our algorithms because we're doing so many operations. I would say uh, in the graph world and in the sparse world, uh, the equivalent of that is the accumulation of non-zero entries. We don't have usually a precision problem very often in sparse math because uh, we, there, you know, multiplying by zero or adding zero introduces no error, right? So we don't have an accumulation of error when we do that. Um, and so the accumulation of error is less important, but we're very concerned about the accumulation of of more non-zeros. Like we're particularly concerned if we're mostly working on sparse matrices that we not do an operation that resolves in the matrix, the matrix becoming dense. So, you know, uh, uh, you know preventing, uh, you know, non-zero blow up is sort of the sparse equivalent of preventing error blow up in the dense world. And obviously this is even more true in, in the hyper sparse, sparse world where you can't even, you probably can't even store order n of the data, you, you have to sort of really, you know, make sure you're controlling and preventing uh, zeros from blowing up. So moving on, uh, one of the important characteristics of the graph laws is that um, we wanted to really uh, have it operate over what we call diverse semi-rings. And I'm not going to go into too much in the differences of, of what semi-rings are here. You can just, uh, if you Google that or look it up in the Wikipedia entry, give you a very nice uh, a notation, but, but, or a, a definition. But, you know, one way to think about it is that, you know, normally when we do our vector matrix multiply, the two arithmetic operations we're working with are, uh, you know, arithmetic multiplication, followed by arithmetic addition, right? And that's what we normally uh, think about. But the basic properties that we want to preserve when we're doing these kinds of operations, particularly sparsity and linearity, which really means the, uh, that, that multiplication distributes over addition, is actually preserved by other pairs of operations. And sometimes we denote that with this funny uh, punch drunk emoji here, which, which meant that you know you walk, you were you went to the bar and you lost the fight. Um, that uh, that uh, you know that we have essentially an arbitrary uh, multiplication operation and an arbitrary addition operation, and it's a semi ring if it uh, basically obeys certain uh, properties of linearity and uh, you know how it behaves 
with various uh, additive and multiplicative annihilators and I encourage people to, to look up semi-ring for that information. Here are shown in this chart uh, a number of additional types of semi-rings, you know, whether it be what we call the max plus or min plus, the max min and min max, and the max times and min times, and essentially shows that if you use these different semi-rings, and you know, I've assigned actual numeric value to the vertex here and to the edges, that you will get different numbers. Each of these semi-rings will highlight and draw out different things, but they actually all preserve the sparsity of the, of the calculation. So uh, again, this is a very useful property that uh, is, uh, and capability that is in the graph laws, uh, which allows you to do a number of wonderful things. Obviously, we're very uh, aware of the traditional arithmetic semi-ring that does most uh, things, but the max plus uh, semi-ring plays a huge role in um, deep neural networks. So you can think of when you do deep neural networks with a rectified linear unit that essentially, you know, you're first doing an operation over the traditional semi-ring followed by another operation over the max plus semi-ring. And me and some of the folks on the call have a paper on that. There are other uh, semi-rings. Uh, likewise, max plus also um, uh, plays a, a strong role in path planning. So if you're using your, your Google Maps or something like that, those can often be represented as operations over max plus and min plus. Another one that's not listed here is the union intersection semi-ring, which plays an important role in set math and is actually the basis of relational algebra that's in all databases. And I really should probably include that in this chart, but um, you know, union intersection is also another extremely important uh, uh, semi-ring, uh, again, and we use it every single time we buy anything on the internet, we're using uh, you know, relational algebra there. So let me move on here. So uh, now I now want to expand your thinking beyond sort of traditional matrices, that's basically what we've been talking about, into something we call an associative array. So an associative array, you can think about an extension of hypersparse, it really encompasses all the other, mat all the other matrices that I've discussed. But here just shows a sort of a, a, ta a table of data. And this table has row labels that happen to be strings. It has column labels, okay? And it has various values here, which can be, you know, uh, uh, strings or dates or numbers, right? And we can create sub-associative arrays by just selecting, you know, subsets of them. So I've created a sub-associative array A1 and a sub-associative array A2. And the big thing we're doing here is that we're now expanding the label space of matrices from the traditional, you know, I have each row and column is drawn from a set of integers, you know, one to M, one to N, uh, one to N right? We're now saying, no, we're drawing the row and column labels from essentially any strict uh, totally ordered set. So that could be any string, it could be any set that we can have a strict order on, and that we can use that now to label these, uh, label these associative arrays. And the advantage of this is that one, this very naturally ties into databases, it very naturally ties into things as mundane as spreadsheets, and we find that when we talk to other people about data, it's far more natural for them to look at data in, in this way where it has you know, labels and the values have meaning rather than just abstract matrices with numbers. And so uh, this is a very powerful representation. It allows us to uh, incorporate a, a lot more data. And again, allows us to have arbitrary uh, sort of values uh, that we're representing uh, as well. As long as the values are essentially a strict totally ordered set as well, you know, this uh, associative array uh, 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 representation works. And again, I strongly encourage you to look at uh, the book, which goes into this in great detail. So just a little bit more on this. So just just shows you some basic mathematical operations on these. So we're basically, here we are adding or oring these two associative arrays. Here we are subtracting them or set differencing them. Here we are anding them. And, you know, this is all very natural to view these associative arrays uh, in this way. And whenever I show this chart, uh, you know, I often ask the class, you know, so, so what's wrong with this chart? You know, there's something wrong with this figure. And 
if you remember everything, you know, anything we taught you about matrices, the, your, you know, red flags should be going off. And usually no one answers because they actually find this very natural. And the point is that we essentially added two associate arrays, in this case, A1 and A2, that, that had incomplete, you know, they, they didn't, their, their numbers of rows and columns uh, didn't ex exactly match, right, in terms of the way we're representing it here. And that's because what's actually going on here is that I'm only showing you in A1 and A2 the non-empty entries, right? But you should imagine in associative arrays that each one of these uh, uh, sub-associative arrays is sitting in a large C of zeros that, exp that, that cover the full possible range of all possible rows and all possible columns. So you can imagine there's a near infinite number of columns between every single one of these uh, columns here and a near infinite number of rows between every single one of these rows here. So I can always add them together because even though their sort of numbers of rows and columns don't appear to be the same in the way I draw them out, they're actually still there. And we find this is actually very natural for people because it allows them to forget the conformance rules of matrix mathematics in terms of addition and multiplication, which they like to do. Uh, this just feels more natural to be able to add and subtract and, and even multiply arbitrary uh, uh, associative arrays. And of course, we're preserving the labeling throughout the process. And so whenever we have something that pops out, we actually know what it is. And again, we find that uh, mo most people really find this representation to be far more intuitive and more natural for uh, the kinds of data that we see in the real world. So moving on here, uh, there is a whole algebra of this. Uh, this is sort of a UML diagram of it that talks about what an associative array algebra is. And we basically draw the labels from a finite strict to totally ordered sets. You know, it's built on semi-algebras. And of course, the operations are over semi-rings and associated algebra are semi-rings. I won't great, go into great detail on this. Of course, you can read the book, but it is a great sort of entree into abstract algebra and uh, understanding some of the beautiful uh, mathematics that is out there in the abstract space. And then I will then wrap up with some related topics. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff, there are many sort of uh, related topics that you can uh, research there. Uh, that are called, talked about tropical algebra, tropical geometry. That's whenever you're using like max plus or min plus, those are often referred to as tropical algebra, tropical geometry. Fuzzy algebra is often just sort of the general case of when you're ever using max or min as operators in these things. Uh, bottleneck algebra is another name. Uh, interestingly, uh, there's a, there's a, a group uh, in Europe that refers to this as nonlinear algebra. And of course, the theory of matroids, which sort of deals with more general uh, constructs of matrices. So with that, uh, uh, hopefully I didn't use up all my time. Did I use up all my time, John? Should, am I, I'm, I'm, am I, I'm afraid no, no. so. We should, we should move on. But um, I, I am going to go. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Let us, let us applaud vir virtually. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I am, I am going to move on directly to the next talk because I do really want to save uh, 15 minutes at the end of the session for general questions. So, so if you have specific questions for Jeremy about his talk, please hold them and, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, I now will introduce our second speaker, Tim Davis from Texas A&M. Uh, and he's going to talk about sweet sparse Graph Blahs. Take it away, Tim. Well, hi, everyone. Great to have you all here. Um, so I'm going to dive into some of the implementation details of my particular implementation of, of Graph Blahs. It does have those hypersparse matrices that I, I stole the idea from Aiden and others and implemented it. Um, but I did want to put up this list here, if you can see my screen. Um, these are basically think of a a MATLAB for arbitrary sparse matrices where the basic operation, you think of what you can do with a MATLAB matrix. You can multiply it, uh, and, but, but, but it's extended. You can do it on a semi-ring, okay? And I have a MATLAB interface for this. For me, the semi-ring is just a string, like quote, 
plus dot star, unquote, and then stick in anything in the string you like. There's an element wise multiply operation, which is like the dot star in MATLAB. There's like a matrix plus, except you can use any operator. You could use element wise add, but, but the additive operator is say max. And you might have an integer matrix, you might have a complex matrix, um, extract and subassign. What I want to do is focus on two of these parallel kernels, the matrix matrix and matrix vector multiply. And then also um, one that is surprisingly difficult to take, took me 6,000 lines of code easily to write, is the, the assignment, which is subsassign in MATLAB, CIJ equals A. How do you do that efficiently and in parallel? So the matrix multiply and the, um, and first of all, the data structure, what data structure I'm using. I'm using both compressed sparse column and compressed sparse row. And uh, you can tell my matrices which, which to be. The default is CSR, unless you're using my MATLAB interface, in which case I'm conforming to MATLAB. So it's CSC, compressed sparse column. And that's how I actually think. Uh, so uh, all of the illustrations will be by column, but I store them in, I mean, the default is mostly by row. So you have to just transfer. A sparse uh, matrix is in MATLAB, a uh, sparse CSE, for example, matrix, and I have these matrices. It, you think of it, you could think of it as a dense vector of sparse vectors. So you have an array of size n, each of which is hanging off a sparse vector of pot potentially like zero. So you've got some wasted space there. A hypersparse ray makes that top level dense vector itself sparse. So you can compact it greatly. Uh, then I have two notions that I use to update this, to make this data structure much more dynamic. So a compressed sparse column matrix, you basically have one column and then the next and the next, and they're all nicely packed together. I keep the indices sorted. So inserting is difficult. You have to shift all the entries down just to add one entry. That's far too slow to do uh, many times. Uh, and then deletion, the same thing. You have to pull all those entries out. And so um, Stan Eisenstadt uh, had, had this, actually this idea, and, and so I've just expanded it. Um, well, he and I were talking about this one day, and I'm using uh, what I call a zombie. Okay, zombies are your friends. Uh, this is a friendly zombie. It's, a, it's an entry that's in the CSR or CSC data structure that's just tagged, marked for deletion. And I, I tag it with the negative of the row index. Well, the negative zero is a thing too. So I negate it, if you will. I can still then do a binary search, but I may come across as zombies. Zombies can come back to life. If, you, if I assign a zombie and, and, and another assignment comes in and wants to say, hey, let me insert it. Oh, you're already there, but you're dead. Now you're back to life again. Uh, so there's zombies and there's pending tuples. This is an entry that's waiting to be inserted. And I just keep this, like in MATLAB, you might have this unordered list of two tuples, rows and columns and values in some jumbled pile. They have to be sorted and then insert it in. And I, I do that inside the data structure. My matrix now has all of these components. And the values can be just about anything you like, any scalar of fixed size. There's built-in types, integers of all sizes, unsigned and signed, single, double, single complex, double complex, and anything. You can have a user-defined type. So I have an example where the user-defined type is a four by four float matrix and a 64 character string, because why not? Uh, and we're working on arbitrary variable size types as well. There's an entry that's not present, okay? That's not necessarily zero. If you're in the max plus summer ring, if you have an edge with weight zero, that's very different than no edge at all if you're asking how far am I to California? Well, an edge of weight zero versus no edge would be infinite. I can't go across that, that length. So with the implicit entry is defined by the summer ring you use, and the matrix can pop and back and forth between different summer rings. So let me show you two uh, parallel algorithms uh, that I use inside. Uh, first is my matrix multiply, and it's also my matrix vector multiply. And I use three, I have three, whoops, I can't count. Uh, I can do math, but I can't count. Four basic methods, sorry. Um, a Saxby style method where you have a column and you want to form the set union of multiple columns. I call it, that's a Saxby style. And I'm gonna use both Augustus and approach. We have a, a gather scatter workspace of size N, which works great until N is two to the 60. And you don't kind of have that kind of amount of memory. And then I use a hash method. I think that first, uh, uh, Iden uh, is on the, on the chat here. 
Ahi and Arafal and Nagasaka and Matsuoka came up with. And I've extended this to make it a concurrent data structure with atomics. And then there's some various dot product methods, which are really handy, particularly when there's a mask. And I don't know if, let's see, Jeremy didn't talk about a mask. The mask is vital. If you think of, of a graph algorithm, never any many times it'll have inside the very core of the, of the loop, oh, well, if the node's already seen, don't touch it. That if statement becomes a bulk is a mask operation. The mask, actually, you can do this in MATLAB, C of M equals A of M, if M is a logical matrix. It's called logical indexing in MATLAB. It's the same thing if you've seen it there. It basically says, I'm gonna assign a matrix onto another one and oh, you can write it here, but not here. That's what the mask is doing. And that's providing that little control inside. And it's also powerful to exploit in terms of computation. It can reduce the computation way, way down. If there's one entry in the mask and I'm doing a matrix, matrix multiply into another matrix, well, I just have to compute a single entry, not the whole thing. So the Saxby style method is going to use four kinds of tasks, all used together in a single A times B. And um, the tasks, I basically do a pre-analysis and decide what tasks I'm going to use. And I'll use the letter F as the flop count. So those tasks, there's four kinds, each with three variants. So you either have a mask or you have no mask or you have a complemented mask, which is to say MIJ is negated. Now the course skepsis and task is, is fairly straightforward. Here the idea is you chop up the matrix and then any given thread is just does all of A times its own columns of B. And it has a single gather scatter workspace that I allocate and then it can just do skepsis and that's it. And then the parallelism is very simple. The fine guesses and tasks is a little more complicated. Here, the, you may have a matrix or maybe just a single vector. Okay, so there's only one cus course guesses and task that could fire off. So we want more parallelism. So instead, uh, if, if I come across either a single vector or a very dense vector within a bigger matrix, I may assign multiple threads to compute A times B sub J for that one column. Okay, so now we have a single Gustafson workspace where we're going to do gather scatter into that they all share, but then there can be collisions. So here is where I use uh, atomics. All these threads on this column share a single Gustafson workspace, but n could be to the 60. So even that will fail. All right. So there I can use a hashing instead. So the same pair of operations, same kind of task, except sorry, you don't have size n workspace. You have a hash table. And here the hash table is allocated dynamically. And then I pick it as four times the flop count that I will use to compute that region or that column of the result. Uh, and you can't have more than F non zeros in the result anyway. So four times F gives me some space to allow for low hash collisions. And then on top of all of these, the fine guesses and task and the fine hash tasks need to be able to have two threads come in and say, hey, I want to write to there. No, I want to write to there. It's an atomic operation. And we have to do this symbolically and numerically. We have to figure out, is the entry present? Who got there first? Update it. And do the update atomically. How does that happen? Well, um, this is what happens uh, in the fine guff system task when there's no mass. So there's 12. I could have 12 slides like this. I'm just going to show one of them. Um, it's a concurrent data structure. Okay, so I have two arrays of, it's Gustafson, so I've got uh, arrays of size n, n could be big, in which case I won't use this method. So I have an array of size n for the values, and then I have a single one byte wide array for the state, a little finite state machine with four states per entry in this vector, okay? It starts out all zero. And I'll show you in the next slide uh, how I'm gonna use this finite state machine to manage the symbolic and numerical computation. The algorithm breaks up into four different phases. Phase one, scatter the mask. Oh, whoops, well, there is no mask, so this step is skipped, but I would do that if I had a mask. Scatter the mask into F, okay? And I'll show you the, actually, I'll show you the finite state machine for that later. So I'm going to exploit the mask in the finite state machine, okay? And the first example, I'll, I'll leave that out. Phase two, is going to scatter and sum the entries into X using this little finite state machine F, F sub zero, F one, F two. Every entry has its own little tiny finite state machine using atomics. 
And then I'm going to have a cumulative sum to count how many did we all find. Um, and then do a cumulative sum across the entire matrix and then gather phase five into the final result. So here's the finite state machine that's going to be used, that's used in phase one and two, um, and also be used to gather the result at the end in phase five. So here's the finite state machine. You have to imagine one of these for every row of the matrix. See this vector, this workspace of size n, and you have to imagine one of these little finite state machines for every row index i. Okay. So initially, the, uh, and let me use a little cursor here. Here's my cursor. So initially, we start here. All of the uh, entries in this matrix are in initial state. F is, starts out as zero. It's unlocked. It means that the entry Cij has not been seen, and the numerical value is uninitialized. So I don't have to allocate my and initialize my workspace X. I just have to calc this space F, okay, to make it all zero. Now what's going to happen then, I'm going to use compare and swap. So a thread comes in and says, hey, I want to write a value to position five. Okay, let me take my uh, number three, which denotes the lock state, and do a compare and swap, and I got back a zero. That means I own it. Not only did I own it, but I'm the first one in, and I've swapped in a three, and I got back a zero. So that means this state here has been, has been transitioned. Okay, so now we're here. Another thread comes in and tries the same thing and says, ooh, I got a three. Oh, someone else is in there. I better wait. Spin, 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 spin. Okay, finally, when the first thread is done, the first thread got a zero, and it says, oh, oh, well, xi is not initialized. So let me put the first value, I'm doing, let's say, a sum, a plus monoid. Um, I'll put the first value there, because I don't have to plus it with anything. I'll just stick the first number in there. So now it's initialized. Whenever it gets unlocked, we don't unlock with a three. We swap the, the it's not a swap, it's an assignment. The owner of this lock who got the zero, Writes a two. So now the thing is unlocked. So now the state's down here. Now this other thread that's spinning, spinning, waiting, trying to swap in the three and swap in the three, it finally goes, swaps in the three and gets out of two. Oh, someone's left their breadcrumbs. Someone's gotten here before me. And now um, the state has transitioned from two to three. But now I know that I own it and X sub I has been initialized. Symbolically, the entry has been seen and now I can update the entry. Okay, so that's a three state finite state machine for the fine Gustafson task. Now with a mask, it gets a little, it's a little different, okay? The mask, the phase one starts with everything all zero again and all the threads just in parallel and there's no collision here. They just write the mask to where it appears. Okay, now the way the, the, the finite state machine is used is the mask M basically says if MIJ is one, you can modify that entry. Okay, if MIJ is zero down here, well, you, you can't, you can't, you're stuck here. You can't touch the entry. It's not gonna be part of the output. It doesn't get computed. You don't write to it, you just ignore it, okay? So whenever a thread comes in and says, in the second phase, it says, oh, let me try to look at the state. Oh, it's a zero, oh, well, forget it. So, so this, this state then in the second phase just spins here and we ignore it. But from here, once the mask is one, well, now we can do the rest. So the rest is of, the, of the finite state machine then is identical to when there is no mask. There's just an initial condition here to check to see, well, when, how did it start? Because if you're down here, if you know it's, you're in state two, well, you don't need to know that the mask is one or zero. It's been modified. So you only got here through the case where the mask is present, see? So I don't need to know down here, does the mask permit me to modify it? But that's already been determined because otherwise I would not be in state two. Or if I'm spinning and looking at this thing and oh, it's state three, well, I already know that the mask is true. So I only have to, mod I only have to flip with this mask once during the whole computation. If the mask is negated, then this whole thing flips. So you start in the state where MIJ is zero. If the, when the mask is negated, if MIJ is zero, then that says, well, you can, if it, the mask is zero, it means you can modify it. If the mask is one, you have to ignore it. 
So you, you go into this dead state, this bit bucket here that says set the mask to one and now, sorry, can't touch it. So that's the complemented mask. Nice mask. Um, now this gets a little more complicated when we don't have this many finite state machines. This assumes one finite state machine per row index of the matrix for this task, for these threads sharing this single Gustafson workspace. Now, if there's two columns in the matrix, those other set of threads have their own set of these uh, Gustafson workspaces. But what if N is too big? What if N is two to the 60? Sorry, we don't have 2000 terabytes of, of, of mem memory. So now I use hashing. And here the hashing looks just the same, okay? Except now that my hash table, which is of size 4F and my numerical visor so are size 4F, it's no longer a two bit integer or an eight bit byte, okay? It's 64 bits and it splits into two parts. The index of who lives there is the upper 62 bits and the lower two bits are the previous diagram. Those two bits define, defining the finite state machine. So I've got the, the two lowest bits for the four state finite state machine, the same as before. And then the upper bits tells me who is at that position. I have five minutes? Five minutes, Tim. Okay, so um, then this gives me the same set of states. All right, so let me jump ahead now to the performance. So a lot of details of how this states work. Are you there? Are you, do you, when you, when you grab an entry, you have to know, are you there or not? And so there's a hash function, linear probing with linear probing. And if you grab a, a, a hash entry and you say, well, that's not my row, you move on. So let's move on. So here's the, here's the performance of the parallel matrix matrix multiply. And this is on a fairly modest size matrix. It's in my collection. It's 9,000 by 9,000 with 3 million entries. This is MATLAB 2018A. And here's MATLAB with double and complex with single thread. And I can, I can beat up the guy who wrote this <laughs> code because it was me. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm beating myself, yay. <laughs> I've figured out more, I've better, better, uh, better methods, I guess. So I'm 4 tenths of, I'm 10% faster now with a single thread, but now with this parallelism uh, on 20 or 40 threads, now I'm getting a much better speed up. So now versus say, uh, I'm getting on 20 cores, I'm getting a speed up of say, for instance, 27 with double complex. MATLAB doesn't have single complex, I do now. And so now my single complex sparse matrix multiply is 29 times faster than MATLAB's double complex because it doesn't have single complex, but it could. Um, so um, that's the matrix matrix performance. Uh, matrix vector, and I've, I'm cheating a little bit here because I'm not including matrix times dense vector for which it's tough to beat MATLAB actually. Um, and I'm not getting as good a, good a speed up against, against MATLAB in that case. But here again, um, I'm taking a decent size matrix, three million, this is not hypersparse, three million by three million, 14 uh, million on zeros, uh, not too, too shabby. Let me, let me jump ahead to uh, three minutes to talk about zombies, oh my goodness. Well, there's 128 versions of this assignment statement. Okay, so let me just show you one of them and explain how it is I get it. This is a simple case. Uh, I'm doing the assignment now, taking an entry and putting it into the matrix. I first do it a structural extraction. So to do the assignment, I first extract out a submatrix. That extraction doesn't tell me the values of the matrix C I'm writing into. It's a position into C where that entry lives. And so an S and A have the same size to do this assignment CIJ equals A. The second pass then doesn't change the C matrix. I take an entry in A, I look it up in S, and I say, do you live in C? If you do, it gets updated. I have an entry that's not present in A, so it must be deleted. Do you, can I delete you from C? I just look through S and that tells me that I have to flag you as a zombie, okay? And if it's not present, I go back in the set of pending tuples. And then the third pass then finishes all these tuples together. So let me just look at some performance numbers. Here's the extraction, okay, with the matrix is 100 million by 100 million with a billion entries. So it's still not hypersparse, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm just doing a random assignment into a matrix of size 10 million by 10 million 
in a total of one and a half seconds. Okay. And MATLAB, that's about uh, seven times faster than what MATLAB can, can do. Uh, then the assignment stage looks a little different. So here's a, here's a case where I'm doing AIJ is twice AIJ. Uh, so there's no change then on zero pattern, no zombies, no pending tuples. And I get a speed of about seven versus graph laws. And so it's about three times as much as the, the uh, extraction because it starts with this extraction actually. And in my syntax, this is actually doing both. I mean, this is actually doing this in MATLAB. I mean, it's, I have a MATLAB overload for the sub, for all this. And so I'm calling graph laws with this very syntax in MATLAB to get these run times. If I did it, my C API would be slightly faster. Um, and then this is where I'm, I'm modifying the matrix a little bit. This is a billion by billion matrix. No, 100 million by 100 million matrix. I'm extracting out a, a piece of it that size about uh, 10 million by 10 million, shifting it down by one, multiplying by two, and sticking it back in again. And this is the total time it takes. So um, that's the performance. And then I have a few other algorithms where uh, between the centrality, I get some nice uh, parallel. Here's the bottom line down here, some nice parallel speed ups, 25, 20 on, on all those threads. And here's page rank. I can also, because of the matrix vector multiply is dominating this algorithm, uh, I get some good parallelism there. So that is um, all I'd like to share with about the kinds of algorithms that are going inside graph laws and its MATLAB interface, which has really been fun. Uh, and I'll leave that uh, if you have there any questions, please. Okay, thank in. you, Tim. We applaud vir virtually. Um, there, we have a couple of minutes for questions. There are actually, since we have 80 odd participants, I am going to ask anyone who has a question, please raise your hand in Zoom in the participant menu and also um, restart your video so that we can, we can see you. So. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for raised hands. And I am seeing none. Maybe I didn't give people enough, enough warning to, to raise hands. Um, okay, in that case, I think what I'm going to do is uh, reclaim the couple of minutes that we have here in order to have a, a, a more complete discussion at the